to briefly explain the structure of today's webinar. In the webinar, Kamil is going to look at several strategies for teachers of different subjects across the curriculum to enable them to maintain high expectations of EAL learners whilst supporting their English language development. And Kamil will also propose ways in which teachers can continue expecting high of these learners whilst teaching them remotely. If there is time at the end, Kamil will take any questions that you may have. So feel free to type your questions in the chat box as they come to you and I will collect them and post them to Kamil Hello. at the end. And tomorrow you will receive an email from us with a link to access the video recording of this webinar as well as um, any relevant information mentioned in the webinar. But enough of me now. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Kamil Trebiatowski. Kamil joined the Bell Foundation in September 2018 and holds the post of digital resource developer. Prior to joining the foundation, Kamil spent 18 years teaching English as a foreign language and English as an additional language in Poland, England and, and uh, Scotland. Welcome everyone. It's uh, great uh, to classrooms. see so many of you. He was an so EAL we'll start uh, well, with a welcome school, first. As well and, as an uh, EAL consultant. We'll look first at uh, and learning intentions. Kamil holds an MA so in this webinar, uh, so just to give you an idea what we'll be doing, uh, we will consider so over to you, Kamil. why maintaining high expectations of learners uh, using EAL is vital, which strategies, uh, methods and tools to use towards a goal, so uh, hopefully uh, it will be for you as practical as we uh, wanted to make it, and how to do so during the times of remote learning while also ensuring the emotional well-being of learners using EAL. And so, so uh, and, and that, so that uh, learners uh, using EAL continue to develop their English language skills, uh, and therefore they are supported to achieve their full cognitive and academic potential. And uh, expectations of learners using EAL remain high during this current, current time. Okay. So our today's webinar is divided into three sections. First, we'll look at uh, how, high, uh, how high expectations have been defined in the past uh, in relation to the classroom and what is expected of teachers in England in this regard, just a very quick overview. Uh, and then uh, we'll focus on how this relates to uh, learners using EAL. And then uh, comes our largest section, which is supporting learners' EAL strategies, as you can see. Uh, we we'll look at three different strategies, and um, and then at the end uh, uh, we will look. Uh, you'll be able to ask uh, me questions. Okay. So uh, first, okay, maintaining high expectations for every pupil has long been perceived as a crucial aspect of learners' education, and this can be linked to uh, Pygmalion effect, which was introduced by Rosenthal. Uh, Following their school research, Robert Rosenthal held that high expectations lead to better performance and low expectations to worse performance. So we can see the quote here. When we expect certain behavior of others, we are likely to act in ways that make expected behavior more likely to occur. So in a classroom, if a teacher holds low expectations of a pupil, that pupil might believe, uh, uh, might behave, sorry, in such a way that confirms the teacher's pre-existing expectations, so for instance, be disruptive in the lesson or not study for a test, and vice versa. High expectations foster growth and better learning. Uh, okay, now, secondly, uh, a learner having low confidence uh, in themselves can thus become, uh, uh, that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is, a, as you can see, a false definition of the situation evoking a behavior, which makes originally false conception come true. So if the child does not believe they can pass a test, they won't study for it, which will lead them to not passing the test. But of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that they couldn't pass it if they studied in the first place. Now, regarding EAL learners, um, uh, 
uh, some teachers perhaps might take the, uh, the, their English language barrier to learning, uh, that that means that they are capable of less, leading to lower expectations of them. A good example of this might be a learner using EAL being placed in a lower math set in secondary school due to their English language barrier and EAL status. However, language barrier has little to do with cognitive abilities and giftedness in maths. Okay, so now in terms of, so in England, teachers are expected to have high expectations of their pupils. Uh, in clear recognition of these claims in the FE's teacher standards, a teacher must set high expectations which inspire, motivate, and challenge pupil, pupils, and set goals that stretch and challenge pupils of all backgrounds, abilities, and dispositions. And also, in terms of Ofsted, in their new revi newly revised uh, uh, inspection framework in 2019, in its quality of education section, it is requiring education providers to have the same academic, technical, or vocational ambitions for almost all learners. We'll talk about this almost in a second. Uh, the implication being not just the same low, but rather high ambitions for all learners. Now, Ofsted also insists that all learners should study the full curriculum and specializing, as you can see at the bottom of, uh, uh, of those citations, uh, should only occur when absolutely necessary. Now, that implies that in the case of uh, the EAL cohorts, there should be no dumbing down of content, so to speak, or insisting that learners cannot participate in the curriculum because of this language barrier. Okay, finally, uh, on the previous slide, we did see that Ofsted talks about uh, having ambitions, the same ambitions for almost all learners. Now, elsewhere in Ofsted education inspection framework, uh, it says uh, that uh, uh, that where accessing the same curriculum is not practical, for example, for learners with S, E, and D, uh, the redesigned curriculum is still to be ambitious to meet their needs. Now, some might interpret the English language barrier to be so high for learners using EAL that it is impractical for them to access the same curriculum. However, the S, E, and D code of practice states that difficulties related to EAL are not to be equated with S, E, N, and we can see this on the right here. In other words, academic and cognitive abilities of a learner, uh, is, uh, uh, they are not impaired because one uses EAL. Therefore, the case for ensuring the learners using EAL participate in the same curriculum as almost all learners remains strong. Okay, so now uh, we're moving on to the last slide before we, uh, we go into uh, uh, the further section on strategies, which is what does it mean for EAL? Um, so, common to all learners, let's start to common to all. Common to all learners is the need to maintain high expectations, uh, as this will help the learners, all of them, to reach their full academic potential. All, almost, almost all in offset words, learners need to be enabled to access the entire curriculum. Okay. So, these are the two uh, that I just mentioned. Now, specific to learners who use EAL is the idea that the English language barrier need not to be a reason for lowering expectations because language does not determine one's cognitive and academic ability and potential. Once those uh, English language barriers have been removed, learners can engage with the curriculum uh, uh, on a par with all other learners. So in short, if we remove the English language barriers, uh, whilst at the same time developing those learners' English language skills, we can and should maintain high expectations of them, which is, as Rosenthal held, which th this will lead to their better performance at school. So we can look at uh, that uh, here at the bottom. Removal of English language barriers plus development of English language will allow us to uh, main uh, maintain high expectations of them. Okay. Now. Um, during this particular time of remote teaching and learning, learners using EAL in particular might be less exposed or not exposed to English due to the fact that they are not interacting with their peers or interacting with them uh, uh, to a considerably smaller extent. So this puts them at a greater disadvantage and there is likelihood that it lessens their ability to access the curriculum. We'd also like to say that uh, some of the learners using EAL are already at a disadvantage uh, uh, and greater risk of uh, underachievement. So consider, for example, learners who are new to English or perhaps refugee learners. Their issues might only be exacerbated uh, by this uh, current circumstance. And therefore, holding high expectations of learners in this group may be of particular importance during this 
current learning uh, remote learning period. Okay, I'm going to do uh, the first uh, uh, of our activities. Uh, so, uh, can you use the chat box, please, and uh, and write down your ideas? How would you place the same uh, or similar expectations on learners from EL? In other words, uh, what would you do? How would you be able to uh, uh, to achieve this uh, in the classroom? And we are talking here generally, so it could be about the regular physical classroom or the current time now. Yeah, we've got some uh, great ideas already. Differentiation, visual reinforcement. Uh, thank you. Pre-teaching. Your coding. High cognitive challenge. Lots of uh, things on differentiating. I'm not going to be able to uh, uh, catch up with all of them, but uh, lots of great ideas. We've got uh, uh, vocabulary teaching. Uh, absolutely positive encouragement. Translation. We'll be talking about translanguaging, in fact, uh, in a moment. Uh, so we'll look uh, closely at that. Thank you very much. These are uh, lots of fantastic ideas, and I certainly uh, am in agreement with uh, everything you are putting uh, down there. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely. So uh, uh, a lot of strategies there. Uh, so we mentioned differentiation. There is uh, the use of visuals, focus on vocabulary, focus on, on grammar scaffolding um, as well, and definitely also just simply uh, uh, pastoral actions in the sense that, uh, yes, they can do it and they uh, need to be uh, encouraged to think that. Okay, now the second question is, what then are some of the challenges that could arise? Uh, and so let's uh, perhaps think of that now. So we have lots of good ideas of how to do this, but what could, uh, could be difficult? Lack of resources, yeah. Uh, Self-doubt. Uh, so there's a more uh, advanced academic texts like uh, Macbeth, lack of time, preparation of resources, um, low level in home language, uh, experience of teaching EAL, absolutely. Uh, might be issues with uh, cultural matters, country cultural understanding uh, as well. Um, being overwhelmed. Thank you very much. It's fantastic. Huge amounts of ideas uh, there. Uh, yes, if uh, <laughs> if uh, if there is little differentiation, then that certainly uh, would be an issue there. Um, different levels of education. Thank you very much. Huge amounts of ideas. Uh, we do have the time. I will uh, I will come back to this during the Q and A uh, time. Uh, uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, what comes next is going to, uh, 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 to 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 touch on some of the things that you just mentioned. So, uh, uh, and we'll be able to, to address this uh, in the next uh, section, which is on strategies. Okay. So, uh, let's uh, let's move on now to our strategies. As I said, we're going to look at three different strategies. Uh, and so, if we do that, uh, we should be able to uh, keep the expectations high. So. First of all, uh, we would like to stress first that uh, we are well aware of uh, teachers' workloads, particularly at this present time. Uh, so teachers such as yourself are under significant pressure during this time, and the strategies we present and suggest below aim to help you to help, help, help to reduce your workload rather than add to it. So presented here uh, in a second in this webinar are three of 20 of our great ideas, which are on the website on the Bell Foundation website, and they can be adapted for remote teaching. Um, there is also no reason why the same strategies would not uh, be able to be used or adapted uh, for all learners in your class, meaning you wouldn't necessarily only be adapting these for this one group of learners, uh, but language development is good for all learners. So uh, we would like to say this first before we move on with our strategies. Okay, so. Uh, translanguaging was already mentioned in the task uh, uh, in the chat box task that uh, that we just did. So first of all, what is it? Uh, there, are, there are a myriad of different definitions of translanguaging. Some are very academic and not necessarily relevant to, to, to our school context. But the one that is useful is uh, this one by Kenos and Gorter. Uh, 
translanguaging is a set of intentional practices intended to in integrate uh, uh, two or more languages in order to develop learners' multilingual repertoire and uh, language awareness, obviously practices in the classroom here. So in other words, uh, we wish to use these learners' first language or languages intentionally, judiciously, uh, within the curriculum context, therefore enabling them to participate in the curriculum. So, for example, maths uh, does not need to be taught in English, clearly. Uh, so uh, we could use other languages for that, whilst developing their multilingual skills and bro broader language awareness. Okay, so why is it important? Well, uh, this means that we treat bilingualism and multilingualism as an asset. So it is one of the tenets of the pedagogy, and as we have stated it on our website. Uh, now, using the first uh, language in the class will allow teachers to take advantage of uh, those learners' prior, no, low, no, uh, sorry, prior knowledge, which is often mediated by the first language. Now, in turn, this will enable learners to participate in the curriculum on the same cognitive and academic level. Okay, so I'm going to show you some examples now. Uh, translanguaging involves using more than one language in the classroom, mixing them, if you will. So, for instance, uh, a learner could first uh, write an essay in their first language and then translate it to English. Uh, we're going to have exactly that kind of uh, example uh, in a second. Uh, uh, and uh, then they could also discuss a topic in the first language. Um, so if at least two learners in your class speak the same language, and then they share it with the class in English. Now, they could also re, uh, listen to a recording of a talk, for instance, in English first, and then discuss it in their first language. They could uh, watch a video in their first language uh, first, perhaps ahead of a lesson to get introduction to the topic and the key themes, and later collaborate with their peers in English, now having understood it fully. Um, and they could also create one product. So, for instance, a poster where the first language and English are used on the same sheet of paper. So these examples are obviously for a learner who is a bilingual learner. Uh, thus, uh, we only speak here or of first language and English, but with a multilingual learner uh, with more than more than two languages, more languages, of course, could be used. OK, so uh, let's have a look at this one example from a classroom. Now, on the left here, we can see a portion of work of a female student who first answered some questions about animal habitats in her home language, Romanian, and only later did she translate it to English. Now, I'll wait a few seconds uh, before moving to, uh, to the next slide so you can have a look at this a bit longer, and then we'll move on to the English translation. Okay. Uh, now, this is the English uh, product from the learner. When this is done in this way, some students report that it is easier to only uh, think about uh, uh, about the content when they first write in the first language and later focus on English translation. Uh, in other words, cognitive load is removed from learners if they can focus on content when writing the first language and then language when writing in English separately. Uh, in the case of uh, this particular student, her writing in English was considerably stronger thanks to this approach when compared to having done everything through English previously. Now, on the Romanian uh, slides, there were some indications that she self-corrects her errors. Uh, if you saw, uh, uh, if, if you looked at the words, uh, she had crossed out. Um, so uh, that would indicate literacy skills in the first language uh, that her teachers could draw upon. So uh, that's uh, one way to, uh, that, that's just one example. Another one is uh, an example from another learner. Here we can see, let me put it on, uh, uh, a part of a poster produced by a Portuguese speaker. So uh, the terms uh, are in English. So waterfall, source, interlocking spurs, and so this is just a portion of it. So there were more terms on the sheet, but the definitions are in her language. And this is an example of a product where, so where both languages are used. The teacher, of course, did not understand uh, Portuguese. The teacher was English uh, in this classroom, but the, same, the, the learner later used her Portuguese definitions to talk to the teacher in English, which she found considerably easier uh, now having the full understanding of this concept. So uh, 
if you will, that's also kind of a scaffolding of this whole process. Uh, okay. So um, how does translanguaging exactly help high expectations? So we ha having had a look at these examples. Uh, okay, so first of all, it allows learners to use full, uh, uh, to, to, to take advantage uh, of their cognitive and academic abilities to the full and of their prior knowledge. These abilities and knowledge may be masked by the English language if teachers insist on English language only. This is particularly important in earlier levels of English language acquisition at say new to English and early acquisition stages where learners are less able to express their knowledge and reflections on learning in English. Uh, as we said previously, if learners uh, focus on content when working uh, in the first language and then on translating their content to English, cognitive uh, load is lowered in the process, enabling higher quality of work. The use of the first language means that there is no need to dumb down or simplify content for these learners. If a learner feels that they can, uh, that, their, uh, sorry, uh, that their identity uh, here is, uh, which is mediated by uh, language, at least to an extent, if that is respected, they are able to participate fully in lessons and they're able to, uh, to, to a level comparable uh, to their English native speaking peers. And then the likelihood of their higher, uh, higher motivation increases, which of course means that the teachers will be able to expect higher of them. Okay, so uh, after each uh, strategy, we're going to have a short task, uh, and these questions will be actually the same, but uh, we'll be talking about uh, three different strategies. So, first of all, if you could use the chat box to um, uh, answer these two questions. First one is, uh, how can teachers use translanguage and remote learning? Uh, thinking of tools and online resources that uh, teachers can uh, can take advantage of to use uh, translanguaging online, but also think about uh, where technology is not available. Uh, so I'm going to give you a, a minute or two to uh, to do that, um, and then um, we we'll provide some our ideas as well. Thank you very much. I've got online dictionaries, definitely. Uh, Google Classroom translates, fantastic. TED Talks, interesting, because this, this is actually something that uh, one of the next slides is going to be about. Uh, thank you. Pictures for no technology, that's right. So uh, perhaps they could be uh, uh, sent over mind maps, immersive readers, huge amount of ideas. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, listen to stories in the first language, thank you. Uh, captions on videos. Of course, peers that speak the same language, uh, uh, that's the case in a large number of schools and classrooms. Um, Quizlet, uh, which is a flashcard uh, uh, creating online piece of software. Um, YouTube, uh, bilingual dictionaries, thank you, Karen. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much for all of these, um, all of these ideas. There's uh, clearly plenty of them. Um, maybe give it uh, another 20 seconds or so. Um, Padlet is a great idea because, uh, as you yes, uh, it, it, it allows for collaborative uh, work. Um, and absolutely, it is easy to add the first language uh, uh, information and keywords to the pre existing resources. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, move on. And uh, the next couple of slides are just simply some of the ideas that, that we had, but uh, clearly <laughs> you had. Uh, more than we can ourselves present. Uh, okay, so first of all, uh, Google Translate was mentioned, and that's probably the most obvious one. Uh, so learners might not have um, access to a paper bilingual dictionary at home, so teachers can take advantage of this online uh, one. Learners will find it easy to uh, copy, paste, and uh, any comments made in words or other office uh, suite programs and translate them in order to understand uh, with other learners in, in, in their class more easily. Um, and uh, of course, uh, Google Translate is available on most mobile devices. So that's, uh, that's the first one and that's probably the most uh, uh, obvious one. Now, there's, uh, there's another translator out there and that's called uh, Voice Translator. Now, this one uh, does not only translate, uh, but uh, these translations can be downloaded as MP3. And then, of course, you could share this with learners. So 
this would mean that the teacher would be able to enter their task instruction, keeping them as simple as, uh, as possible. Um, and then, um, so otherwise, the translation might not be able to handle that well, as I'm sure you will know. Uh, these things are not perfect. And then their pupils could simply listen to, uh, uh, to them. So, oh, sorry, uh, moved too far. Uh, so the, 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 this is an excellent choice if your, uh, if your learner is not literate in their first language in the sense that uh, perhaps they can't read it, but they can certainly uh, listen to it and understand it. So uh, that is a useful tool and it is completely free. Um, uh, it is, as you can see on the, sc on the screenshot, supported by the adverts and ads, but that's about it. But uh, uh, you can simply download uh, the translation. Um, now, there is also Khan Academy, which is a well-known website with hundreds of video lectures uh, on a number of different curriculum subject topics. And what is uh, less known is that uh, uh, many of these are available in 30 different languages. Uh, so here we have a screenshot, of, uh, as we can see, a lesson uh, with video lectures in there about line graphs and gradients, uh, so mathematics in Polish. And as was suggested before, such videos could be watched ahead of a lesson uh, so uh, uh, to prepare and understand the contents uh, better. Um, so that's Khan Academy there. And again, it is also free to use. Um, okay. And then actually TED Talks, uh, one of you mentioned that in the chat room in the activity just before. So uh, this is a well-known video website, so which also has an app for mobile devices uh, with thousands of formal lectures on a number of topics and uh, formal implies here academic language and so uh, uh, this is very advantageous uh, for learners any learners to be uh, exposed to almost all of these videos um, are subtitled in multiple languages and some are spoken uh, in other languages so for example there, there, there are um, arabic speaking speakers there are spanish and, and other languages are represented so this is also quite useful and may be linked to uh, the curriculum topics that are done in the classroom. Okay, now uh, some learners might not have access to uh, technology, uh, uh, so or perhaps not have internet or Wi-Fi at home. So then, what can we do if that's the case? Well, first of all, uh, schools could uh, purchase books in the learner's first language, that is to say, textbooks treating the same subject and content. So here we have two examples. Uh, of a biology book, use uh, a, a Russian one, and then a math textbook from Poland. Both of these books, by the way, can be purchased from UK bookstores. Uh, when we share the recording of this webinar with you tomorrow, I will put links uh, to, to, to these textbooks uh, in the description uh, of that YouTube video. But just a few minutes of, uh, of a Google search uh, uh, should allow you to find ones uh, your learners might need. Um, Secondly, we might send a paperback uh, or hardback bilingual dictionaries home. So where other learners might not have dictionaries at home already, and we said that they should, have, uh, should perhaps use Google Translate, here the situation is reversed. Um, uh, we might just simply send them the paper dictionaries. Um, and then finally, um, you can send home a printed resource pack, including activities, uh, and then uh, to be done in the first language there. And let's not forget that uh, uh, obviously, obviously parents will speak the French language as well. And so uh, uh, if they have something to do where, uh, you know, and not necessarily be able to understand uh, the tasks sent by the school in English, but they could certainly help their, uh, uh, their children uh, using their first language, their family language. Okay. Okay. Um, we are going to move on to the second uh, strategy which is graphic organizers. So as we state on our website, um, in the great ideas section, graphic organizers are, are sometimes known as key visuals. They're not simply images, they're ways of presenting information visually. So some examples are cycles and timelines, for instance. Okay, why is it important? Well, uh, they allow learners to organize their thoughts before speaking or writing them lowering cognitive load, uh, much like was the case with some translanguaging approaches. They provide learners with curriculum content in accessible formats, so visual, nonverbal format. Then uh, graphic organizers scaffold learning whilst keeping the cognitive challenge high. Okay. So uh, 
as previously, we're going to look at some examples. So uh, we'll know a lot of these organizers. Here we have examples of a cycle, a timeline, and uh, a Venn diagram. Now, it is advisable when working with learners using EEL to add some words or phrases. So, for example, in a word box, for instance, connectives uh, uh, indicating time could be provided for learners to use where the arrows on the timetable, the, the one that we have here on the top right, uh, are. So, for example, we could uh, next to these arrows, we could put uh, words, phrases such as next, subsequently, following, after, afterwards, uh, and so on. So this would support learners in linking the separate words, phrases, and ideas into coherent sentences and paragraphs. Uh, OK. So here is an example of a completed organizer. This is uh, for a history lesson on peasants' uh, revolt. Uh, so we can see the clauses, uh, sorry, the causes in the middle column here. And then that leads to three different consequences. Now imagine this organizer as an empty blank. We can see here that it's completely filled up just to give you an idea of what it looks like, uh, it's supposed to look like in the end. But let's just imagine that this organizer was completely blank. Uh, and these phrases uh, that we have here now would be provided in a box under the organizer, then to be put in the different blank boxes. Now, alternatively, we could leave these sentences in. So but take uh, in, in those boxes, but, leave, but take out some of the words. So in other words, we would be creating a gap fill activity. So for instance, let's imagine that we would remove all the verbs and then we would ask the learners to provide the past simple forms of these verbs. For example, so we would remove from, uh, from the causes uh, boxes, uh, introduced, hated, and tried. Then we would focus on an aspect of English whilst teaching the curriculum content. content. Uh, so uh, that's an example of a graphic organizer. Okay, and now how uh, can they help us with uh, high expectations? Well, what has been termed as uh, uh, by by Stephen Krushen, linguist, as comprehensible input, that is ensuring that learners understand the language used. So full lesson content is made accessible to learners. Secondly. Clarifying the relationships between ideas and structuring sentences, for instance, as we saw before, by using connectives. Now, previously, we saw time related connectives. Others could include because, hence, therefore, as a result of, and, and more. Uh, because organizers are nonverbal, language barriers are removed. They are usually internationally accessible, in a sense, and the relationships between concepts are easier understood. Now, it is still a good idea to actually uh, teach learners how to use them, of, of course, if, uh, if they are new to using them. Uh, but uh, typically, they are easily understood, particularly the relationships between different uh, items on the organizers. And finally, uh, they also support uh, meaning-focused inputs, that is, listening and reading, and output, and that is speaking and writing. So after filling in the organizer, learners could use them just as well to produce an essay in writing or speak about the topic to the rest of the class. I should also mention that obviously you could um, think uh, if that's possible and it doesn't take too much of your time. So for example, uh, put some of the things on the graphic organizers for the learners in the first language. So we could mix those two strategies um, as well. Okay, so. Now we're going to do the same as we did before, but so we're going to do this now for uh, graphic organizers. So again, uh, how could we use, how how could we do this in the classroom uh, or in the current um, online uh, uh, environment, and also where technology is not available? So I'm going to give you some time to think about this. Definitely, we can certainly print uh, worksheets to take home. Thank you, Maria. That's right, yeah. Uh, add copies, post them. Um, yes, there's, uh, there, there are certainly uh, uh, whiteboards out there. That's, that's, I'm presuming that's online whiteboards. My own, I haven't heard about that resource before, so that's, uh, that's great to know. Uh, visualizers, Google Slides, so they can be completed, certainly. Um, 
uh, so graphic organizers on PowerPoint exactly. That's actually the next uh, slide that we're going to look in a moment uh, at. Uh, sentence strips to be arranged for for sentence variation. So uh, so we could use uh, those. Uh, Twinkle uh, is a fantastic resource, and uh, there are lots of uh, is there. Um, I'll let Twinkle uh, coming up again. Uh, use sentence builders. Um, Mind maps, darts activities, which are also one of our um, one of our uh, great ideas. Um, people can fill flowcharts with main points of text. Thank you very much. Fantastic amount of uh, um, ideas here um, uh, coming through. Thank you very much. I'm going to give it uh, another 20, 30 seconds, and then uh, um, uh, we'll show you some of our ideas for it. Uh, graphic tools and PowerPoints. That's right. Uh, uh, writing with symbols. There's Widget Online, which is an excellent resource, uh, and a lot of that is uh, is uh, graphic organizers uh, heavy. Um, uh, that's right. Uh, okay. And recordings can be uh, can be sent home as well. That's right. So uh, 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 recordings could be also used, uh, particularly if you are worried that you know uh, the, the learners uh, need to know how to use it. So it would be a good idea to model the use of the organizer in the first place, and uh, and then actually uh, they would either be able to uh, uh, to listen to that if they have access uh, uh, to uh, uh, to the internet and devices at home. Okay. I'm going to uh, uh, move on. Um, because we still have one more strategy after this to talk about, and it will be good to have time for uh, questions at the end. So, uh, okay. So this was mentioned already. The easy, probably the easiest way to use graphic organizers in Microsoft Office Smart Arts, uh, which are those graphic organizers in there. The screenshot here is from Word. On the right, we can see a cycle organizer. Um, and uh, that can be easily inserted into any document within the, the uh, within Office. So uh, these are obviously easily editable, meaning that peers can collaborate on such work online from different locations, and teachers can easily add uh, uh, comments. Uh, so both peers and teachers can add comments remotely. Um, secondly, uh, there are many interactive whiteboards out there online where learners can collaborate on completing a graphic organizer while talking to each other. So, for instance, uh, through Skype. So, uh, now this one presented to you here, AWWAPP, uh, is free. It uh, allows anyone to upload PDFs or, or JPEGs. Uh, so, uh, and so, if you had a graphic organizer in a PDF form, and you'd be able to upload that, uh, that here, and then that can be annotated uh, by the learners. And then uh, after that, it can be exported uh, as well. Uh, so we could, uh, we could use uh, those kinds of tools. OK, uh, hopefully uh, that gives you some ideas. And obviously, there was a huge amount of ideas in, in, in the chat room. Uh, and the final um, strategy we are going to talk about is uh, substitution tables. OK, so first of all, uh, what is it? It's uh, it's a table that provides modal sentences with a range of choice for learners to select from using a set pattern. So we'll see some examples on the next slide, one of the next slides. Uh, it is a very useful scaffolding resource supporting both speaking, writing, uh, and, and, and writing skills of learners using EAL. Typically, it's used for uh, writing, but it doesn't need to be. It could be scaffolded for speaking as well. So why is it important? Well, these tables model target language structures so for instance tenses they are um, easily uh, focused so that they support the development of english language whilst addressing the curriculum so they also help learners to create accurate sentences whilst encouraging independent learning so they provide grammatically correct models of language use but give learners a measure of control over sentences they create so we're going to look at a couple of examples of uh, these now. The substitution table here is one of our teaching resources uh, for a lesson about friction in science. So learners choose uh, one phrase from each column, eventually producing a sentence. So for instance, if we start from uh, 
braking on a bicycle on top there, then we can say braking on a bicycle produces a little friction, which is useful, and then because, and then the sentence uh, could continue. Uh, now, we should note that a sentence can be grammatically correct. Uh, this table actually ensures this, but uh, of course, might be factually, in terms of the curriculum, incorrect. So substitution tables have a dual focus, if you will, on language and on the curriculum, making it a powerful tool for school contexts. Um, okay, now it doesn't need to be all text. So uh, there are two ways in which we can use images. First, we can explain, a caption the words, as in the first table here. Now in the second, the images replace the words, meaning that uh, when a learner uses the table, they need to change the images into words. Uh, so here the images signify different types of cells um, in the second one there. This substitution table is from a science resource. So the words are science keywords. But teachers, of course, can choose to turn, uh, to, uh, can choose to uh, choose aspects of language uh, that they turn into pictures. So for example, this could be uh, reach, carry, absorb, join, and transmit. And where to you edit the table, we could choose these. So it is up to the teacher uh, to decide which uh, which words to, to turn into pictures if you'd like to do that. Now, the, uh, the level of challenge is higher in the second substitution table because learners do not have all the words they need written down for them. So they, they, they need to obviously turn pictures into words when they write their sentences or speak them. Um, other ways to differentiate uh, challenge is uh, when using these, uh, uh, is uh, by differentiating grammar. So uh, we have just seen the, this substitution table on the previous slide, and who made and studied are examples of verbs in past simple tense used in active voice. Now we can alter this table so that the sentences are no longer in active voice, but in passive voice. So here you have was flown, was made, or uh, was studied, or were flown, made, studied. Um, uh, so an aeroplane was flown. Uh, the pictures now also replace the words that are no longer captions. So you, so you can see the pictures on the left of the table, they, don't, they no longer have captions. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, challenge our learners further, let's turn some words in the table into gaps. Um, they will need to provide the words. And then, of course, you could also have the, uh, you could choose to have a list of the words under that, that table or not, depending on how advanced uh, learners are. Um, and uh, so uh, this is again more advanced uh, uh, because it's, this calls for a greater range of vocabulary since the pictures need to be replaced with words found nowhere in the table anymore. Okay. So how do these help with high expectations? Well, they promote academic language from day one because of the insistence on the correct use of structures and teachers' abilities to insist formal language. For instance, instead of have, we could insert contains and expect learners, even those who are new to English, to use them, indicating to them the correct use of English registers and, and structures. Um, so we are able to do that. Uh, they are flexible uh, and can be designed to suit uh, all levels of English uh, language proficiency. As such, they help to maintain high cognitive, academic, and linguistic challenge uh, at the same time. It is also important to mention at this point that uh, uh, a, a sort of uh, an efficient substitution table allows you to uh, allows learners to create a large number of sentences, which means that they would get to repeat the same practice again and again, and that means that uh, uh, they are more likely to retain this in their memory. Uh, so it's conducive to learning language. Uh, the substitution tables also support content-based language teaching, so we can teach present simple tense or passive voice structures through them. Uh, teaching language through the curriculum, so for example, for history, science, and geography topics. And uh, as I said before, although they are typically used to support writing, they are also advanced uh, sentence frames and as such can be used for speaking as well. Okay. so. Uh, we are going to now think about uh, the same again. Uh, how could we use these uh, during remote teaching when we have technology or not? Uh, if you could put your ideas in, in the, the chat room as well.
Uh, absolutely, it is uh, certainly useful not only in uh, English but uh, other languages as well. Yes, great idea. We can certainly uh, let the students create them themselves. They could uh, uh, then demonstrate their understanding of structures in that way or, or vocabulary. Printed tables go home, absolutely. Um, um, upload in Google Classroom or so, so, so share with the learners in that way. Um, uh, ah, excellent idea. One student creates it and the other one has to put the sentences uh, together. Um, uh, yes, we can use Pixabay or other uh, uh, image uh, uh, image resources online uh, to put in the, the substitution tables, certainly in speaking uh, uh, as well. Um, we can, uh, we can uh, use it as uh, home learning assignments so they can complete their substitution tables. Um, demonstrate what, demonstrate what, they, what, what they have learned as well, absolutely. Uh, that's what they are very useful for. Um, Right, so uh, I'm going to be speaking about recordings, uh, uh, recordings and substitution tables in a second, and give feedback to to this activity, uh, and use with Google Translate. Absolutely. So uh, uh, one thing that's uh, that's uh, that wasn't there, just simply because uh, we only have so much time, is that of course you could uh, use the the first language uh, in these, especially if they are just uh, one words or short phrases, and uh, and then you, you could so you could put these other words in, in the first language, and then the learners would have to actually translate them back into English for you when they are actually writing the sentences. So that's another uh, that, uh, that it will be like an equivalent to to, to pictures, not pictures, but uh, words in the first language. So huge amounts of ideas uh, there. Thank you so much for uh, uh, for sharing all of this uh, with us. Um, I'm going to uh, now show you what uh, what we think uh, uh, that could be done. So. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, there is no piece of software, it seems, that would help teachers to produce substitution tables. So this needs to be done in Word uh, or MS Word or any other um, uh, Word editor. Once they are created, of course, they can be shared digitally during remote teaching and learning over email or cloud sharing systems. Uh, so several of you mentioned that already in the chat box, if, if your school uses uh, such cloud sharing systems. Now, where technology is not available to learners, uh, um, at at home, you can always, and that was also mentioned in the in, in the chat room. You can you could uh, print your substitution tables and send physical copies home. Uh, it is important to uh, no, sorry, uh, one more thing. It is important to explain to learner how to use these tables in the first place. So in a physical classroom, teachers could sit with the learner, but this is not now an option. Uh, instead, teachers can record a simple video, and that's where the YouTube comes in. Uh, showing and modeling the learners the process of using it. Now, even better, you could uh, record such videos directly on YouTube. Now, if you speak slowly, YouTube will automatically close caption your speech. Uh, so I did this actually last week just to check that this is actually true. And uh, you can see here um, that uh, my words, well, there are no capital letters or full stop, but everything else is just exactly what I wanted it to be. So it will do that, and those captions appear five minutes after you've uh, you've recorded that. So uh, it is rather helpful to see, uh, you know, words transcribed, particularly for a learner who is new to English. If there are issues with technology and you need to send physical copies of substitution tables home, it would be a good idea to send an example of how to use these in the first place. So you could simply draw arrows on the table showing how to create one sentence out of it and ask the learner to write more of them. Um, okay. Um, another thing is, uh, from sim aside from simply writing down the, the sentences in a text editor, uh, they, uh, the, the learners uh, could uh, record their voice when speaking their sentences. So there are many tools online, although of course most mobile phones will have voice recording capabilities, uh, saving MP3 files, but Clip It uh, is, uh, uh, that creates link to uh, uh, to an MP3 file after it has been recorded, and that can be shared with uh, with other people. Uh, there's also Rev, which allows users to simply download the file, uh, which then can be shared. So uh, these are free; they are easy to use. 
Now, learners could also produce a video recording online if they have access to a camera. So the first of the uh, suggested uh, uh, such resources online here is uh, online video recorder, uh, and we'll, it will do just that. And the, the, the resulting MP4 file can be downloaded afterwards. And the second one is, uh, let me bring it on, it's, uh, it's called Screen-O-Matic, uh, that's browser-based, um, um, actually records video activity on one computer, on, on a person's computer screen. So basically does a screencast. So learners could open the substitution table the teacher had sent them and then narrate it if that's possible and then record their voice. So you would basically see almost in uh, how they use it in, in, in real time as well. Okay, so now the question is, so these are all our uh, substitution tables, all those three. Now, um, we're going to open a poll in a moment because it's a poll task. And uh, uh, all I would like to, uh, you to do is to indicate in that poll, which of these strategies you think is most useful for your context. And then once you've done that, could you put into the chat room why you have said this, or why you have chosen that one? So uh, if you can bring up the poll, there, you've got these three, so we'll see which one seems most useful to you. And then if you could write uh, something like graphic organizers are the most useful because and just one sentence will, will, will be more than sufficient uh, for us today. So, so far, looks like substitution tables are the most popular. Um, thank you. You see that substitution tables are easy to use. That's great to know. Um, that's right. So uh, we're adaptable, scaffolding tool. Uh, uh, some of you mentioned translanguaging as well. Uh, substitution again, uh, linked to the use of academic language. Uh, yes, that's right. Translanguaging is obviously it requires less preparation on the part of the teacher, so it's also a time saver in a way. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, but also, as uh, as was just mentioned in the chat room, translanguaging can help you see what the learner actually knows and uh, their knowledge because uh, it's not masked by the English language barrier. Absolutely. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, most useful, so uh, translanguaging is useful to, to, to teach science, it's, uh, it's uh, scientific concepts uh, there as well. Not, uh, uh, learners not stopped using their own language and that is uh, linked to confidence and that's sort of what I, thank you very much uh, uh, Amanda, uh, that's what I was trying to uh, uh, say at the very beginning of the, uh, uh, of the webinar. Okay, uh, we've got something about five minutes, so I think we should uh, uh, um, move over and uh, if I remember correctly, yes, now it's time for our questions. Unfortunately, we only have five minutes, but uh, we'll do the best. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. So uh, the idea is, of course, uh, to, for you to write, uh, 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 unless you have written, so I think Sharka might, if, if you ask questions before, then uh, the Sharka might be able to post them to me or, but also put them in the chat, uh, chat room and then uh, I'll answer yes. well one, two or three, however many we Thanks a lot, Kamil. And I do have one here in store, quite a general one from Fiona Noala. Uh, whose responsibility is it to respond to the needs of EAL pupils and to encourage high expectations? Well, um, ideally, this would be, uh, how should I put it, everyone, uh, in the sense that uh, it certainly shouldn't be the responsibility of just one uh, 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 you know, EAL teacher or EAL coordinator, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly. If we go back to the teacher standards, uh, um, you know, uh, they would, uh, which does specifically talk about uh, uh, high expectations of all, I think it's, it simply lies with, uh, with every teacher in the school. Um, uh, you know, but of course it would be, it will, it will look differently in, in say, a uh, uh, withdrawal EAL class, class if that, if, if once, if that exists and you know in individual lessons with CA learners and it will, will look different if you're, if you're a subject uh, teacher but 
uh, the, the idea here is that, of course, uh, for example, something like translanguaging can be can be used across the score. And the reason, one of the reasons um, I have myself on designing this webinar put this because this is exactly what happened in my school. I tested uh, this approach out in my classroom and then uh, spoke to other teachers, uh, did the training, and then it was uh, it was basically used in you know this was a secondary school in. Uh, history, geography, maths, English, other subjects by other as, as a differentiation strategy. And so, as was mentioned in the chat room, it is useful because it doesn't require a lot of preparation because it's the children who do it. So uh, that's, 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 so that can be quite popular, you know, so uh, hopefully that answers that question. Thank you, Kamil. And we had, to, because you spoke about translanguaging and also the use of translation, uh, we had a question from yes. Rose. How do you balance translation versus encouraging pupils to develop their language skills without becoming reliant on translation? Mm. Well, so per, per, first of all, perhaps uh, uh, because it should have been mentioned that Google Translate is great, but so don't let them translate the full sentences because they will just completely, you know. So, so there is the, the, there is that, and there might be a, a, a difficulty now because if you say to uh, your learners, you know, use it at at home, and then you have no way to stop them from doing so. So uh, that's a good question. It's uh, that that line is kind of difficult uh, uh, to draw. I would say myself that. You might want to think about this as a sort of continuum. If you think about new, uh, new to English learners, all the way to, uh, to the fluent uh, learners, and uh, if you sort of think, okay, they need more support of that sort uh, when when they are new to English. That is not to say that we should at any point sort of turn off first language. That's not the point. That is, however. Uh, we do know that if you are on say band C, you will be able to engage more with the curriculum that you are A. So in other words. Uh, when I said that um, um, it's new to English, that that knowledge that they bring with them, the prior knowledge is more mediated by language. It's just simply that they are not able to express it in any other way at that stage because they don't have enough English language skills at that point. So, uh, so perhaps you can sort of think of uh, as they grow and progress uh, in terms of English language proficiency, you could sort of start relying less on it. Uh, and hopefully, you know, so, so, so that's one way, but there's no one, Sort of, you know, uh, boundary at which it is it is a difficult uh, thing. Uh, and I would also say, just maybe as a last thought, that um, actually uh, a part of it is to actually encourage them to use English rather than uh, the first language because that is high expectation. We are basically saying to them, yes, you can do it in English. You, you do not have to rely. So, you know, we could have that conversation with uh, with the children as well. Okay, thank you. And I think we've got time for one more question. And that was from Julie, and she asked, well, if the text being studied has language at too high a level for an EA learner, how do you balance high expectations and meeting their EAL needs? Yeah, I suppose that would depend what it is, because uh, hopefully some of, some of the topics uh, will be able to actually be studied at a full level in the first language. And that's why we mentioned the textbooks, for example. But of course, it will depend what it is. Uh, because, uh, for example, some of the English literature obviously will not be studied in Lithuania, so uh, there's no way to sometimes to, to actually do that. Uh, so, um, in you know, in, in in such a case, I suppose what we are really trying to say is that the, the language can be simplified, but it, it shouldn't be the case that the academic and cognitive you know sort of outcomes of of this uh, uh, should be, I suppose. So, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that. Um, uh, I don't think there is any such thing that, is, in other words, uh, we offer support, but we do not uh, lower expectations in the sense of you have uh, you don't have enough language, so you can't actually engage with with this topic per se. Everyone can, but they need more support uh, uh, getting there, right? If that makes sense. Uh, so if if, uh, if all the children in the in a particular lesson, say in an English lesson, uh, doing a task. Uh, are to write an essay, then that child can also write that essay. But perhaps in the first place, as I suggested, they can first do this in in their first language uh, rather than uh, the the you know the the English in the first place. And, and perhaps they are given more time to actually achieve this, and then they can just focus on the on the translating. So it's kind of, but it is. I understand that it, there is a proper ratio that you know sometimes it's just very very difficult to do this. Uh, can I just mention just last last thing? I know it's five already. That if you one of the things that I um, I noticed when I was uh, uh, using 
um, translanguaging in my classroom is that it involves me not understanding what they are saying. And that that can be quite, you know, uh, uh, I think I like control as a teacher. So I didn't quite necessarily, you know, but I, I took that step and uh, that grew their confidence because the, 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 the learners themselves knew that now they have, they have grasped the knowledge and then they could tell me about it in English. But there was a moment where I was a little bit scary, frankly, like I don't know what they're saying. Um, but, you know, it worked. So, yeah, hopefully uh, that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much, Camille, and for the whole presentation. And I'm going to round up now. Um, so, before we close this webinar, I just wanted to remind you that you will get a, an email tomorrow with a link to the video recording. You will be able to see the slides in the video recording as well. And uh, Camille said he'll mention the relevant links and resources in the in the comments underneath the video. Um, and you will also get a link to a survey about the webinar, which will be very grateful if you complete. And I also have a few announcements to make that might be of interest to you or your colleagues. Um, so first of all, uh, our next UK-based webinar will take place on the 17th of March and it will be delivered by Professor Steve Strand and he will present uh, recent findings on his team's analysis of data regarding EA learners from Wales about proficiency in English. So that's coming in a month's time on the 17th of March and Obviously, we also continue to offer online courses and you may be aware that we now offer courses for practitioners in the UK, but also for uh, staff in international schools. And in terms of the UK based courses, the next one running is adaptive teaching for learners who use EAL, which starts soon on the 1st of March. And then the following one starting on the 19th of April will be introduction to EAL assessment. We've decided to rerun this course because it helps teachers make more accurate assessments of the English language proficiency of they, their EAL learners uh, within the context of the curriculum and it will be, as we know, particularly important this year, especially for secondary teachers in the light um, of the need for schools to play a more active role in end of year assessments um, and obviously also for teachers being able to draw on their evidence to inform great allocations. So that's uh, the two upcoming courses for the UK audiences and in terms of Language for Results International, our offer for international school staff, we've got adaptive teaching for learners who use EAL starting next week actually on the 24th of February and then the following course will run on the 14th of April and it will be language awareness for teaching staff. You can find more detailed information about all the courses and webinars on our website, so feel free to have a look. And thank you very much for taking part in today's webinar and thank you to Camille. We will stop recording. And thank you, and thank you very much. End the meeting now. Thank you.